Okay. So, I have looked up your website and it's, it's interesting to what you are doing here. Technovanza seems quite interesting thing. It is very general from all ways of life, as you say. But there's not much science in what you do. There's a lot of technology. There's a lot of uh, uh, people stuff and so on. Not much science. I think you should improve your connection with re real science. Okay, I will try to cover a field which has to do with science in general and chemistry in particular. And my title has been Steps Towards Life. I would like to show you that the evolution of the universe has left, has led to life and chemistry plays a major role in that. In order to start very early, we have to be at the beginning. The beginning is the Big Bang. At that time, our universe started. At that time also, the universe was extremely hot. There was no chemistry. This was the age of physics. Then the universe cooled down progressively, rather quickly. And after about 300,000 years, particles formed. These particles could connect together, make atoms, and atoms could connect together to make molecules. And this is chemistry started around here, 300,000 years after the Big Bang. That's the age of chemistry. But it didn't stop there, of course. In this universe, at that stage, molecules more and more were generated. They began to aggregate. They began to sort of build up compartments. And a new property appeared, a new property, which is life on our planet Earth at that time, more or less. This is on our planet. But of course, there's life in other places in the universe. That's the age of biology. But it stopped. Sorry, what is this? Yeah. But it didn't stop there. And on our planet, the living organisms continued to develop. And the new property appeared, a very important property for us, which is thought, thinking. The organism, the human organism, is a thinking organism. And this is how the steps towards life, from the original Big Bang to physics, to chemistry, to biology, to thinking. And this is the story of our universe. Now, let me just indicate that at this stage, this person sitting at the end of the screen here, this is the thinker, a famous sculpture by a French artist, Auguste Rodin, Rodin, you would say, probably. And this indicates also that this feature now of thinking is what we char characterizes mankind. But this is not the end of the evolution of the universe. The evolution of the universe will continue. The universe will not stop at, ma at human beings. It will continue. Long time, a long time, a long time. So when some people think that we can stop it, this is totally madness. It is not possible to stop this and will continue to evolve. Now, the universe for the moment, as one understands it, is formed of 68% of dark energy and 27% of dark matter, which means 95% darkness. We don't know much about that. But the important thing is that there's 5% visible matter. That's the matter we are part of, we human beings. And that is the matter that matters. This is the matter which makes us, we are part of 5% of our universe, not much but very important for us, for sure. So the universe evolved from divided matter to condensed matter, to organized matter, living matter, thinking matter, and maybe something else even more complex than what we know about right now. This is the evolution towards complex matter by a progressive uh, introduction of more complexity and more information into matter. 
Now, what is the basic question we have to ask then about this evolution? The big question is, how does matter become complex? How is it possible to go from an elementary particle to a thinking organism and maybe even to more complex forms of matter? In order to give an answer to this question, mankind invented science. It's science which will give us an answer to that. And science has many pillars, of course, but let's just look at three of those pillars. On one hand, physics deals with the basic laws of the universe on which everything depends. Biology uh, talks and uh, studies the rules of life, the rules of life, the way living organisms on our planet function. And chemistry builds the bridge between the two. In other words, chemistry has a very, very important role, which is to try to show, to understand how from very general laws of the functioning of our universe, the laws which determine the way our universe functions, entities can come up, which are living organisms, thinking organisms, like the one we know, like so the ones we are. And chemistry has to try to understand how this can happen. Now, there is an answer to this question, how does matter become complex? And this answer is by self-organization. In other words, we can say that this, this word, we understand it intuitively, but we do not necessarily, we don't know what is behind it completely. Self-organization at this stage just means that it happened through the, organ the functioning of the laws of our universe. It happened because the structure of our universe is what it is. We can even say that it's a cosmic imperative that our universe is constructed in such a way that self-organization will occur, that it is not an accident, but it will occur. So the self-organization right now has to be still considered in two ways, because there's no single full theory for the moment or explanation. The cosmic self-organization deals with the cosmic structure, the general structure of the universe, which results from the action of gravitational forces on the inhomogeneities in density and in rates of expansion, which existed right after the Big Bang. This led, then led to the structuration of our universe. This is not what we are concerned about today. This is for cosmologists. For us, it's complex matter which is important, which matters. And this is the molecular matter, which is assembled through bringing together the pieces, the bricks of visible matter through electromagnetic, fo electromagnetic forces, which brings them together to organize the matter, to make it living, to make it thinking. So chemistry within the different sciences is the uh, area of science which deals with the structure and the transformation of matter. And both living matter and non-living matter. So this is one part of chemistry and we will see, however, that chemistry has another branch, another feature, which is a very important one. So for the moment, chemistry is the science of the structure and transformation of matter. We will see another property in a moment. Now, people have done, human beings have looked around and have tried to see what is this matter made of. And progressively, over centuries, one became to find that there are components in this matter, products, substances, which were organized in tables like the one I show you here. This is a table dating from 1718. It's in French, there, as you can see, perhaps, and some of you may know some French. And it has sort of strange, strange symbols we like to show here, just to put that into a table. But this table was a bit not, it was a bit chaotic. There was no real explanation. Why should it be like this and not something else? 
So over the years, over the centuries, this table was filling up, but the question remained, is there something behind which we should know and which would help us to know better what are the bricks and pieces of matter? This was discovered progressively, and in the 19th century, several persons, but the most significant one was Dmitry Mendeleev in Russia, who proposed that these elements, these bricks of matter which had been discovered, could be organized in a very regular way, in a rational way, which, is, which shows how one can put a table, one can organize these elements in a table. And in 1869, Mitri Mendeleev published a very, very important paper. I consider that that is one of the important papers in science of all ages and all times. In this paper, written in German, at that time in a German journal, Mendeleev proposed that the elements which were known in 1869 shown here, as you can see on this picture, these elements could be organized according to their properties and their atomic weights. And this organization led to the formation of columns and of rows, and these were deduced from the, the connections between the properties of the elements and their atomic weights. This, then, is an organization, and Mendeleev even went so far, so far as to say there are some places where he put here question marks and he was saying we will find these elements they are not found yet but we will find them and indeed of course it was done and here for instance these two elements were then found later nowadays this extremely important paper which gives us an organization of the elements making up visible matter is uh, now uh, in a table which is called the periodic table of elements. So this initial paper by Mendeleev was published in 1869, last year was 150th anniversary, and now is, we call it the periodic table of the elements. Now, the, how it looks now is the following. This is now the periodic table of the elements the way it looks presently. These are the bricks of visible matter. Now, this table is of extreme importance. I would like to very much insist on that. This is one of the most important steps in understanding our universe, in understanding matter, because this table shows us in its rules here and in its columns, it shows us all the elements of visible matter. I would like very much that you realize this. It is very important. This table is complete, and in any region of our universe, everywhere, visible matter will be made of these elements, and there are no others. Can you realize what that means? It means that a little organism on a little planet in an enormous universe has been able to put down a table which summarizes, which brings together, which organizes all the elements of visible matter. And this visible matter and these elements and these bricks are the same everywhere. You understand what that means? This is absolutely incredible, but it is true. Now, these bricks, these bricks, these are the ones which form the playground of chemistry. Chemists play with these elements, if I may say so, and from these bricks, they construct different buildings, different houses, if you wish, which are the connections between these elements to form more complex entities. And we are part of it. We, as human beings, are a very, very complicated, complex organization of these elements. I mean, not all of them, but for instance, hydrogen and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and so on. So these elements make us also. So these are the playground of chemistry. 
So from these initial atoms, which connect to make molecules, they do that to build up molecular chemistry by very strong bonding between the bricks of matter. These are by chemists called covalent bonds. Let's forget about the name, but the important thing is that these bonds link together atoms to make molecules. Let's look at two milestones in the development of this chemistry, the molecular chemistry, the chemistry of the assemblies made from elements to build up molecules. We can start with one in 1828, which is quite recent, of course, very recent compared to the age of uh, mankind, let's say. Uh, Friedrich Wörder, a German chemist, realized in the laboratory the buildup of a molecule called urea from its elements, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, in 1828. He did that by transforming another entity called ammonium cyanate into urea. In doing so, he did two things which are very important. Number one, he realized what is called a synthesis, a transformation of matter, converting ammonium cyanate into urea. Second thing, he did something very important in doing that because the starting material, ammonium cyanate, is not contained in living organisms. Urea is in urine in living organisms. So he converted it, he converted an uh, entity which is non, in non-living world to the one which exists in the living world. And this is, uh, this then destroyed the myth, the idea that you needed a special magic force, so to say, called the vital force to build up anything that is in a living organism. This destroys this myth of vital force and it shows that compounds which are in non-living matter and compounds which are in living matter, they are all the same, they are all compounds. There is no, no difference between them, so to say. So this was a major step in understanding that living organisms are made of the same kind of things as non-living entities, non-living products, and so on. Now, 150 years later, chemists were able to build up in the laboratory something much more complicated than urea. I give this example, vitamin B12. This molecule, very complex molecule, was built up in the laboratory from scratch, so to say, by assembling the correct atoms in the 70s of last century. The two groups collaborated to build up this very complex molecule. Two groups collaborated. One was directed by Robert Burns Woodward at Harvard University in Massachusetts, and the other one by Albert Eschenmoser in Switzerland in the ETH, the Polytechnic University in Zurich. They were, of course, not alone, but many, many collaborators contributed to this. And this is uh, so what happened then. Uh, many contributed. I was also postdoc at that time with Woodward, and I, I contributed to that also. So it was a common effort of many, many people around the world for 10, 12 years. Now, molecular chemistry did not start there. Molecular chemistry continued. Let me just see what's going on. There was somebody sending me a mail. Just a second. Okay. So, molecular chemistry continued to develop. It became more and more complex, more new reactions were found, new products we made, new materials were this developed, drugs, a lot of things were done. And molecular chemistry is a very strong science, has very much developed, and it will continue still for a long time. Many new reactions, many new compounds, many new materials will be discovered in the future. But then we have to ask a question. Is there something we should consider in addition to molecular chemistry? 
And this I can introduce in the following way. What you see here, this blue ball, this is a cancer cell. And these two entities here in purple, these are killer cells. The killer cells run around your organism as you are listening here. They go around your organism and their mission is to find out if some cells have gone wrong, if some cells have become modified and have become cancer cells and they have to destroy them. But they should, of course, not make a mistake. That will be a big problem. Similarly, here, you see a white blood cell with blue dots. These blue dots here, these are HIV virus. And this HIV virus, when it hits a white blood cell, will be able to infect it. How does the virus know that it has now reached its target and can infect? Something must happen between the killer cells and the cancer cell, between the HIV virus and the white blood cells, which tells the two partners that they are now together, that they are, they, which tells the killer cells that the other one is a cancer cell and not a usual healthy cell, which tells the virus that it has reached its target and can now infect the white blood cell. What is going on? What tells them this? This comes to the fact that beyond molecular chemistry, there is something happening because these bodies we just saw, they are formed of molecules. All this membrane, all this, uh, this, this uh, delimitation, these units, these have membranes are defined by membranes. And there are molecules sticking in these membranes they are made of molecules, let's say gross, grossly, saying like a soap bubble, for instance. And when they touch each other, they, they tell something to each other. There is a touching process there. And this leads to the fact that beyond molecules, there are interactions between molecules. Molecules are constructed from atoms. And beyond molecules are the societies, the populations of molecules, and this is what we have called molecular chemistry, su sorry, supramolecular chemistry, which rests on the way in which molecules interact with each other. The features of the supramolecular chemistry are, first of all, how do molecules recognize each other, or how do they react with together, or can, we, can they transport themselves be transported through membranes. The basic progress, the basic property is of course molecular recognition. And this tells then the molecules, this, this relies on the specific pairing connections, figuring out how molecules get together with another one. And one way, a very simple way to give an image of this molecular recognition is the following. First of all, molecular recognition, of course, requires an interaction because if the bodies do not interact, if the molecules do not interact, they ignore each other. But that is not enough. In order to recognize, you need information. So the processes of molecular recognition are processes of information. But can very simply represent that in a very, as I say, very simple fashion by saying that there's a geometrical and interactional double complementarity between the objects which come together. And a very, a very strong way to represent that, an image which is a very strong image, is to say that they have to fit together like Schloss und Schlüssel, like a lock and a key. This concept of the lock and the key was introduced by a German chemist, Emil Fischer, in 1894, in a very famous paper also, where he said for, and that was a case, he was studying uh, enzymatic reactions, for an enzyme to react with a given substrate, they must fit together like a lock and a key. 
Emil Fischer got his PhD in our university in 1874. And of course, you are very proud of that. He did that, this work, uh, when he was uh, not in Strasbourg anymore, he was in Munich at that time. Now, let's look at a very important information process which is present in the molecular world. This is, in fact, for us living organisms, for us human beings, the most important molecular information storage process. It is our genome. It is what defines on our planet Earth the information which determines which organism it is. It is this molecular uh, storage of information, this genome, which makes the difference between a tomato and an elephant. And the storage of this information uses four letters, which have been given names by chemists, sort of, sort of trivial names, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, AGTC. And these four letters are planted as sticking on a very long chain, which is shown here, this long chain here, these letters are, uh, are, are arranged along this very long strand in a given sequence. And it's this sequence which makes up the genomic information which determines the type of organism which is, which is characterized by this genome. Now, two such chains can wrap around each other, as you see on the right, and form the very famous double helix, which you see here. So there are two chains wrapping around each other in a helical fashion. So it's the, as I said, the double helix of DNA. Now, this is the information storage. These are very simple chemical groups, which represent the four molecular letters writing the genomic information. The reading of this information is also a very simple process by pairing up letters. Adenine A pairs up with thymine or uracil symbol, but it's a small modification, by two points of interactions. As you can see here, these dots here in this green rectangle, these dots represent two points of touching between this letter and this letter. So two points are pairing up. The other two, Guanine and cytosine, they pair up by three points of interaction. In other words, the molecular recognition between these letters which write our genome occurs by complementary interaction patterns which make these letters pairing up in two, a pair of two, uh, sorry, a pair with two types of interactions and another pair with three interactions. In other words, the reading of the genetic program occurs in a binary way by two, three, two, three. Like in a computer, the, uh, the, the information is read by zero, one, zero, one. Here it is read by two, three, two, three. Now you should also realize, and I suppose you have realized, that this extremely simple process of taking just four letters and pairing them up is the one which determines the fate and the genome, the uh, organism which results from this genome. In other words, it is a 2323 -2 way of reading the information contained in the DNA. So chemistry, in fact, is also an information science because this molecular uh, this information stored in the genome is stored at the molecular level. And the processing and reading of this information is at the supramolecular level by touching between the information, uh, the, the information bits, so to say, these four letters. So chemistry can be considered in addition to being the science of the structure and information of matter. It can also be considered as the science of informed matter. Chemistry is also an information science. And now in these present days where everybody plays around with computers and so on, one should not forget that information contained in living organisms, the way they are 
generated, the way they develop is molecular information and supermolecular processing. And this is the most complex system phenomenon still right now on our planet. So how can I understand that? Of course, people have tried, chemists have tried very much to try to understand molecular recognition. And this was the start of our work also. I cannot go into details, it will be much too long. But let me just say that we have started initially to study molecular recognition, how a, uh, in a system locks and keys can, uh, can recognize each other. For instance, here you have three keys, you have one lock, and of course it is the red key which fits into the lock. So that's a recognition process. The red key is recognized by this cavity, by this lock, which is present in this, what you may call a receptor. These processes have been studied very, very extensively by many, many laboratories. I've given many talks in India also, where uh, people also work on that. Many friends, many colleagues there have uh, working in this area of molecular recognition. So very many studies have been conducted in numerous laboratories uh, on these molecular recognition processes because they are very fundamental. So let's have a look, a quick, look, very quick look at what this is good for. What are, could be the applications for something like that? First of all, as you realize, and all those who are scientists in the audience who listen to me, basic research is acquiring the knowledge. Before that, you cannot do much. Applied research is to apply it. So acquiring first leads to possibilities of applications. Let's look at some applications in life sciences. First of all, molecular recognition is basic in drug discovery because a drug, a drug is a molecular key for a biological lock. A drug molecule is a molecule which has to recognize a biological target and act on it in a very specific selective fashion, meaning that you don't want to make a mistake, so the compounds have to be as uh, precise, as well constructed as possible, so you have to just define to obtain the, uh, the, the to, go, to reach the correct target. This is drug discovery. Drug discovery depends on molecular recognition. On the other hand, you can also imagine many other things. Let me just show you one thing. We make compounds like this thing here, which is this molecule in white, which contains in its internal, it has a cavity inside. And in this cavity, we have introduced um, an element of the periodic table of the elements called europium. And when this element is in the cage, in light, UV light, this emits red light. It's a sort of a red luminescence, like a, LED, a red little bulb. And with this bulb, one can then label immunoproteins. And this has then led to the development of an immunoanalysis system, a machine, which you see here, this apparatus, which you see here, is now used in many hospitals for doing medical diagnostics. So this little thing here, is the label which allows following the uh, process which is occurring for the diagnostics, diagnostics. Another property of importance, as I mentioned, that one basic property of um, uh, supermolecular chemistry, one basic function, deals with transport through membranes. One specific transport of very great importance is the transfer of genes, gene transfer. It amounts to trying to introduce a piece of DNA, a gene, as you see here, into a cell with, for instance, a synthetic vector, which wraps around the DNA and helps it to cross the cell membrane to go into the cell and then generate the final protein. This is a, transfer, a transport, a translocation feature, which enables this DNA piece, this gene, to be expressed in the cell and to generate the protein. Let me just insist on one thing. This, is, this type of processes of gene transfer are very important for 
gene therapy for correcting deficient genes, for instance, in a human where the gene is deficient, you can try to correct it, and also for biotechnology, for biotechnology to, mean, to make GMOs, genetically modified organisms. I would here like to insist that nowadays people are afraid of GMOs. This is totally stupid. I want to insist that we need GMOs and we need use them. And the more we hinder their application, the more it will be a problem for mankind. Mankind has to realize that science has brought to mankind the possibility to modify organisms. We have to use it. We have to modify plants. We have to modify animals. And we will do it. Despite the fact that some will oppose it, they will not be able to do so. The thing will continue and the opposition will lose the game. I am very strongly expressing that and it's my very strong conviction. Now, another area is also the formation, the uh, development of supramolecular materials. And let me just show you an uh, application which was not at all at the beginning within the reach and what we had Im imagined. This is one of these illustrations where basic research leads to applications which at the beginning you could not have imagined. It is very difficult to imagine. So let's have a look at the material, which is a polymer, a plastic type of thing. Huh? And what was done is the following. We had developed in 1990 the idea of making polymers of supramolecular nature, of the type of supramolecular materials. Then in 2013, a company called Xeltis had developed these supramolecular polymers, had made them biocompatible, and had developed a material which could be used as for, cardio, for making cardiovascular implants. And this could be used and were used for the surgical treatment of children which had a severe congenital cardiac malformation and which requ who required cardiac reconstruction. And this was for me quite a shock to see how the supramolecular polymer idea we had introduced in 1990 led to an, uh, an application which could be used for a human being, for children. And here I show you now the first child who was operated on. Here you see this little girl at that time in 2013, four years old, and she was implanted, in other words, their heart was reconstructed. There was a, uh, some of these, uh, some these implants was introduced in their heart by Professor Leo Bocheria, which is who you see here. He's professor at the Bakulev Scientific Center for Cardiovascular Surgery in Moscow. This is three, the checkup three months after the implantation. And you see the little girl looks very nice and very fine. She's smiling. That's, of course, something fantastic for us. And, of course, the surgeon was also very happy. As you can see him, he looks very happy, too. Since then, of course, many more children have been treated. And also, the company has developed pulmonary heart valves, which have been implanted in children. This was in 2000, since 2016, but now probably more than 12 by now. This is the heart valve implanted in Budapest, in Krakow, and in Kuala Lumpur. It is considered that this is a breakthrough in surgical practice to develop such materials which can be implanted into a human being and which then progressively disappear and be, are then uh, sort of uh, replaced by the normal cells. That's another type of um, application of these supramolecular materials, self-healing polymers, because you can realize that in supramolecular materials, the molecules which makes the supramolecular materials can interact reversibly. And so that if you have a plastic material like this transparent film, which you may see here, 
Here, this, work, this is work done by one of my Indian co-workers. You see his fingers here. He takes, he takes this piece of film. Somebody else cuts it with the scissors. Then he superimposes the two pieces in the middle here by pressing with a finger here. And after a little while, a few minutes, you can stretch the film, it sticks. In other words, these materials have the property of being self-healing. You can cut them and then they will, be, they will repair themselves. So this is just a very, very brief introduction into what supermolecular chemistry can do. And let's go back to now the main theme, which is once you, once you know more about molecular recognition, you can go beyond it and supermolecular chemistry then can yield the, a new step, can lead to a new step, self-organization. Can one set up systems which are molecular recognition directed so as to generate in a spontaneous but information controlled way supramolecular architectures on the basis of molecular recognition patterns, the way they are contain information and the way they connect together. That means they read that information. In other words, the step from supramolecular uh, lock and key objects to systems which use these lock and key properties to lead to uh, super, to architectures, to more complex entities in a spontaneous but information controlled way. An example of that is a virus. We know that right now we have this terrible thing, COVID, which leads to this, this SARS COVID-19 virus. But let me here use as example, the, simple, the first virus which has been sort of understood well and which is the tobacco mosaic virus, which is formed by the assembly of 2,130 protein subunits plus one molecule of the genome of the virus, the virus DNA represented by this spiral, this green spiral in the middle. This 2,130 Proteins are represented here. This is one of these proteins. This is a bit more detailed representation. And they interact by surface to surface interactions. These molecules are what you call self complementary. One side of the molecule can interact with the other one. That means this side here recognizes the other side there so that like shown on the, on the left of this slide, like a piece of pie, they can assemble and they have the right shape and the right interactions. I cannot go into that, of course. They can go together and then generate ultimately this kind of helical type of assembly, which has a hole in the middle and in the hole is contained the RNA, the genome of the virus. This process occurs spontaneously. It looks like magic, but it is not at all magic. It's just science. We understand everything that's going on. It is structural chemistry. It is molecular chemistry, of course, structural chemistry. It is physical chemistry. It is analytical chemistry. It is just the way in which molecular matter is formed and interacts. And we understand all of it. It is nothing magical. We can call it a programmed chemical system, a system which relies on information storage in the basic bricks of the, of the, entity of the architecture, which then gets together in a very specific way, arrange one another, uh, arrange each other in such a way that they lead to the formation of the final virus particle. Now, these are <clears throat> programmed chemical systems. The program is molecular. The information corresponding to that program is stored in the components. And the operation is at the supramolecular level. This information is processed through the interaction patterns of the, inter of the recognition. 
process. We can then ask the question, can one do that in the laboratory with completely artificial type of entities? Yes, one can. And this has been developed a lot in many laboratories around the world. The self-organization of such architectures, I will give, I will use as just as an illustration, one category of such architectures, which are called metallo-supramolecular, because they are based on the interaction of metal ions, metal cations, with molecules in a supramolecular way. So the molecules which bind the metals, which are ligand molecules, they are the bricks, the metal ions are the cement, which the connections, which brings them together. Here I can just show you a few of these varieties which have been studied in many, many laboratories around the world, huge number. We have initially started with using, with first trying to make a double helix and a triple helix. This double helix, this triple helix have nothing to do with natural ones. It's just to show, to demonstrate that there are many ways to make a double helix, there are many ways to make a triple helix, and if one understands the way to build the pieces, for instance, the brown strand and the blue strand, and has the correct positions where metal ions may build in connectors. We don't see them here, but they are between these layers, between these entities. Then you can obtain spontaneously, but in a very controlled fashion, a double helix. Here, the triple helix, you see a little bit better, the connectors, these yellow spheres here, which bring together the three strands. This is a case where you have a grid where linear molecules are vertical and horizontal and are held together by three times three, by nine silver ions, which bind the molecules together at the places where they cross. Here I show you a cylinder type of molecule, a much more complex system, because here you have three linear molecules in red, four flat molecules in blue, and here nine, uh, sorry, 12 positions where metal ions can bind and bring these entities, these molecules together. As you see here, three linear, four flat, that is seven, 12 connectors, in that band's copper ions, that means 19 components go together spontaneously in your flask to generate this entity. It is not magic. It looks like magic, but it just depends on the design and the way one understands what's going on. This is just some other illustrations which sort of show that you can make many other ones. And of course, these are some, these are only the ones we have made, but many, many molecules, more complex ones than the ones shown here have been made. And many, many groups in the world work around, work about it because this process of generating well-defined architectures in a very designed way is very important. And why? It can also be of interest for nanoscience and nanotechnology in an organization like Techno, Technovanza, of course, you uh, are, one is very interested in this also uh, because nanoscience and nanotechnology has to do with modern technology, at least with the nano part of modern technology. And now, right now, these nano objects, these nano, these devices which contain, which depend on nano objects are built up by uh, processes of fabrication and of manipulation, nanofabrication and nanomanipulation. However, the processes of self-organization, for which I have just given you very simple examples, but examples which show that it can be achieved, these processes uh, are, in the future, can be very important, maybe not as alternative, but certainly as a complement to present day fabrication and manipulation procedures. In other words, the step will be to go from fabrication, the need to make the object, to self-fabrication, to let the object, to design the components so that the object, object 
makes itself. This is, of course, the ultimate fabrication. And I'm convinced that in the future it will be one way, a very important way. And of course, I can convince you very easily, most complicated, complex computer we still have on our planet is the brain. The brain is self built up. You don't need to make it. It makes itself in the process of the development of the organism. So that's a fantastic demonstration that self-fabrication on the basis of the way in which these entities making up the device interact is an extremely powerful um, procedure since it leads to the human brain, which is the most complex organism on our planet. No computer comes even close to that complexity. So this chemistry, I have just shown you something about, is this chemistry which relies on design, which relies on information and on programmation. Now, this has led to a control, the possibility to generate in a controlled way functional molecular and supramolecular entities of a great, great variety, many groups in the world, many in India too. There is another approach which is one step further, which we are now very interested in, which is mainly our work, which is doing the chemistry not just by design, but with selection. In other words, understanding how we can build up systems in which selection leads to the formation, to the, the uh, selection, to the choosing the correct object, brick, to lead to the final entity, the final architecture. So this selection implies diversity in the building blocks because you want to choose to get the right ones and dynamics. You want to do that in a way that the two the objects don't stick to each other too strongly because otherwise they might stick and not be able to select and to explore the possible different connections and the possible different architectures. So selection relies on diversity of building blocks and dynamic interaction between these building blocks. This is a field now we have developed and many other laboratories are of course joining in. Uh, we call that a constitutional dynamic chemistry what I mean, and I have absolutely no time to get into it, it is a, a, a next step, that means uh, it's not something I can talk about here, also in view of time. Uh, I call it a constitutional dynamic chemistry. What does it mean? It means that the constitution of the chemical object is dynamic. In other words, the bricks which constitute that object, the pieces which make up that object, can fall apart dissociate and reassociate in a reversible way, in a dynamic way. And if the conditions change when it falls apart and when it wants to reassemble, then the object itself can incorporate new bricks, expel some other bricks, in other words, adapt its constitution to the changing conditions. This adaptation leads then to the development of adaptive chemistry, this chemistry which we are now mostly interested in. A chemistry where the chemical object, I just repeat myself to make it clear, the chemical object has the ability to dissociate into its pieces, its components, and they, they can reassemble with selection from this diversity and with the help of dynamics reversibility, and if the conditions change, they will adapt to the changing conditions. This is this area called adaptive chemistry, and which of course is a step beyond, a step further than simple design. Of course, it relies also on design, but it is a more flexible way, an adaptive way to construct these chemical objects. So let me summarize at this stage a little bit. Let me summarize before going to general conclusions. We have all to start with molecular chemistry. The molecule 
which results, of course, from the building up of atoms linking together. That is the basic stone on, with which we can build. Then these stones interact and they become supramolecular entities like this. The atoms are the bricks which make up the molecules and the molecules, so to say, make them the houses which are the supramolecular objects. Then they are organized on the basis of the way in which the uh, building up of the supramolecular object is uh, results from the information stored then become dynamic. You would like to have them dynamic, so to be able to adapt, become adaptive. And this is the towards more and more complex stage of matter. Of course, that's the evolution as we have it today. This evolution of chemistry will, of course, go further and further and further, and it will progressively make even more complicated objects up to the time where we can make objects as complex as a living organism or a thinking organism. But this is much into the future. And let me just conclude with some general remarks on chemistry and on science. First of all, I hope you have understood <clears throat> that the essence of chemistry is not just to discover what already exists in nature. Of course, discovery is very important. But chemistry has also the power to create novel expression of complex matter. In other words, the book of chemistry has to be written, not only to be read. Of course, we must read, read, we must read the book of what is around us, of what nature has already produced on our planet in the universe. But chemistry can make things which do not exist yet among the enormous universe of all possibilities. The score of chemistry has to be composed, not just to be played. To be played is important, as I said, but composing, writing the book, composing the score is what chemistry can do. So chemistry has enormous, basically creative power. The essence of chemistry is also creation of new entities. This can be best illustrated again by an artist, by a sculpture, by the same artist as the one I've cited earlier, Auguste Rodin. In English, you would probably say Rodin. In French, it's Rodin. And this is an artist. He has hair. He is very famous. Many of you may know him. And here you see the hand of the artist here expresses out of this stone a sculpture which is not contained in the stone. It's the hand of the artist which shapes the stone into that sculpture. It's the hand, hand of the artist which creates the sculpture out of the stone, which is just a stone. Chemistry is just doing the same. Out of the stones, the bricks of our universe, the periodic table of elements. Chemistry can shape all kinds of constructions. Some of them, many, many, many exist already, but many, 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 many can be made at the hands of the chemist. So chemistry can be considered as the art of matter. This was already sensed many years ago by this great human being, Leonardo da Vinci. You certainly know her, you, you know him by his famous picture of uh, Gioconda in uh, the Louvre Museum. Uh, but um, I would like just to cite a sentence he wrote. He is best known as an artist, a painter, but he was also a scientist. He was also a an engineer. And this combination of an artist, a scientist, and an engineer makes this sentence he wrote very, very meaningful, very strong. He wrote, on top is in Italian, in his language, on the bottom is translated into English. Where nature finishes to produce its own 
entities or species. This is what is made up of what makes up the, uh, visible matter, and especially we are part of that. Uh, nature has produced us, that means the universe has produced the human beings. Then these human beings, man begins using natural things. What are these natural things? These are the elements of the periodic table. These are the bricks which make up the complex entities which result from connecting these elements. In harmony with its very nature, what does that mean? That means under the control, in harmony with the laws of physics. You cannot go against those laws. You can bring these natural things only together according to the laws which structure our universe. Now, the ending of this sentence is of very great significance. It's of great significance because it's a very strong one for an artist, especially, to create an infinity of species. He meant by that, I suppose, that mankind can now, thanks to the knowledge we have of a uh, the build-up of matter, let's say, I'm sort of now, of course, elaborating on it, create an infinity of species which are not yet there, which don't exist yet, and we can make them at the, our hands. Note that last year was the 500th anniversary of the death of Leonardo da Vinci. Let me insist again, this sentence is extremely strong. For an artist, it means really creating things making them from scratch. And this is a power, basic power of chemistry. Let me just illustrate what science is doing for us. Here in the Greek mythology, the Greek mythology, the Greeks had myth mythology like Indians have mythology also. Um, the, in the Greeks, they, the gods had the knowledge and Prometheus, one of them, Stole to, he wanted to bring it to mankind. So he stole this fire from the gods and gave the fire to mankind. Here you see him running away, holding the fire of knowledge in his right hand here and looking over his shoulder to check whether the other guys would not run, run the other gods would not run after him to catch him. But they were unable to do so. And here he just shows this fire, this light in a very convincing way, he shows it, the fire of knowledge, the light of knowledge. Now, one consequence of knowledge is that we cannot give it back. We cannot give knowledge back. We cannot just erase knowledge. So any knowledge, we have to live with it. We have to, to learn how to live with the knowledge. We just cannot erase it. What you know, you know. And that means also that our path along the way now leads us from the quest of knowledge, trying to gather more and more knowledge. This leads us to the control of our own destiny. We will now, thanks to the knowledge, thanks to what science has brought to us, be able to control ourselves, our destiny. This, of course, relies also on transmission of knowledge. In the past, transmission was happening this way, I suppose you understand, this way of sort of touching, of following up the history of life and of knowledge, of thinking. Nowadays, we can transfer it through our fingers, through our brains, through education, in the future, what will be these connections may be this. Now, I don't mean by that that human beings will only shake hands with robots. Robots are just a very simple. Of course, it looks very exciting to see these robots running around, but this is simple technology. It's not very, it is complicated, but it is not complex. A human being is much more complex than any of those robots running around. But it indicates that 
uh, I want to indicate that it also means that we modify ourselves. Nowadays, we have already modified ourselves. You may have, for instance, the little girl I showed has now a piece of a plastic a supramolecular polymer in her heart. She is modified. She's not the original anymore. We may have a new teeth. We may have a new lens in our eyes. We may have some titanium in our bones just to put them to pull them together, keep them together. And for instance, we may even have an, the heart of somebody else, which means it's not your heart anymore. And this will continue, and we will more and more have a sort of a merger where some form and things will be introduced in the human bodies and they will adapt. And so this will continue. That is what it means, what I mean by that. We will modify ourselves progressively. Now, let me illustrate that also in another way, and especially something related to what you do. This is what I showed in my in, in one of my initial slides. And here is this famous statue, the thinker, which is sitting here, and which is by this statue by Auguste Rodin, here, Homo sapiens, the wise person, the thinker. This is a very famous statue by Rodin, the person here sitting and thinking very hard. So what comes beyond that, or at least, oh, what's the question? Oh, maybe we will change ourselves, but how? What is this lady doing? From Homo sapiens, maybe to the bionic person, I would say, we don't know that. It's not sure that is the good way, but I would call it techno extravaganza. It's a extravagant technology, something like that. I'm not sure we want it, but just to illustrate and the fact that we will modify ourselves and we will end up being different from what we are now today by different means by maybe what we now know about electronics, but uh, maybe also knowing a better way, knowing better how um, an organism builds up and using those possibilities to act on ourselves and to take our own destiny into our own hands in the future. I would like to finish by citing a mathematician. This mathematician is uh, David Hilbert. David Hilbert is a famous mathematician. I have not said much about mathematics, but let's just see. He is buried in a city in Germany called Göttingen, a very famous university city. He's a very famous mathematician. And here is his tombstone, David Hilbert. And there are two sentences here, two sentences which he wanted to be written here, two sentences he pronounced at a, a meeting when he, I think when he retired from his uh, professorship. What are these sentences? They are very strong. The first top sentence is, wir müssen wissen. We must know. That is what we are looking for. That is our goal. We must know is the goal of us scientists and human beings in general. The second part is even much stronger. We are where than wissen. We will know. This is what drives us. Knowing is what is our goal. What makes us doing our work. The goal is to know. We will know that is what drives us. We are convinced that we will have more and more control. We will understand much and much better the universe. We will understand ourselves much better and much better. And we will understand our top entity, our top organ, the brain, much and much better as time goes. Here again, Prometheus showing the fire of science of knowledge, and this allows us to have this 
great driving force that we will know. So for all of us, I tell you, science shapes the future of humanity. And I would like very much to convince you to participate. We need, mankind needs all of you. Mankind needs all of the people who can contribute to this progress in knowledge and needs all the people to make further progress to understand the universe and ourselves. Furthermore, science has also a very important feature, which is that science has no borders. Science does not depend on a nation, does not depend, has no religion, has no dogma, has no borders. Science is across all countries, no flags, no wars, and so on. So I think if everybody on, the, on our planet would just know a little bit more science, the humanity would be in much better shape. So I thank you for your attention. And if there are some questions, I will be very happy to answer them. And I hope you have understood uh, at least that the setup worked well so that you could understand what I was telling you. Thank you very much. Bye bye to all. And please stay, take care, because this virus which is around is not yet tamed. We will tame it, of course. Enormous progress has already been made, much, much faster than in the past. But we are still not there. Okay. Some more patience is needed, some more care. So take good care of yourself. And don't despair of the future. The future is in your hands. The future is yours. Thank you very much. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. We have a Q&A session now. A question and answer session. First of all, I have a question myself. Okay? Hello? Yes, sir. I have a question myself. Uh, yes, sir. Was it, was the connection good enough? And was the lecture understandable? The wording, the pictures, of course, should be all right. But what about the talking? Uh, yes, sir, sir. There was no connection issue and it was perfect. Oh, right. I'm very happy about that. Because at the beginning, there was noise and all that. So if everybody, if it was clear, then, okay, I'm very happy about it. Yes, sir, it was perfect. Okay, go ahead with the questions. Should I go back to us? Uh, to remove the split screen? Yes, sir, we can do that. Okay. All right. So, do you hear me? Yes, sir, you're audible. So the first question is, how self-healing things are appeared when we use supramolecular chemistry? Sorry, I didn't understand it. What is it? Please speak again. Uh, yes, sir. How self-healing things are appeared when we use supramolecular chemistry? Uh, living things. Is that it? Self-healing things, sir. Self-healing things. Oh, self-healing. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, it's not necessarily supramolecular. We have also worked on cases where it was molecular chemistry with reversible bonds. This also is self-healing. I had no time to go into all that because there are two, at least right now, two ways of uh, having, of generating self-healing materials, for instance. One is the supramolecular way where the reversibility depends on 
non-covalent interactions on, on um, breaking off of molecules. And the other way is uh, reversible chemical reactions, which make give also the possibility to the materials to self-heal. Both work. And my collaborator, Dr. Nabarun Roy, my Indian collaborator, I had several Indian collaborators, of course, but he worked with both. He worked both on uh, having um, self-healing materials based on supramolecular self-healing and self-healing materials based on um, reversible covalent reactions. So our next question, how self-healing things appear when we use supermolecular chemistry? Uh, self-healing again? So self-healing things, how do they appear when we use supermolecular chemistry? Uh, yeah, I think it's the same question as the before, isn't it? Not the same question? Yes, sir. Oh. Maybe yes, we sir. should take another one. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Moving on to our next question. How is supermolecular chemistry related to drug chemistry? And if it is, do we need to use nanomaterials or can we go also with the bulk metals? Okay. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, supermolecular chemistry was directly linked to drugs and so on because uh, the, uh, as I said, the interaction between a drug and the, the, the um, target in the body is relying, depends on a recognition process. So the drug is molecular and the way it interacts, the way in which it interacts with the biological target is supramolecular. So you have to understand how to design the drug so it can fit exactly into the active site of the biological molecule and therefore act specifically on that. And we want, of course, the drugs to be as specific, as selective as possible, so as to have no side effects. So it is both molecular to design the molecule, that means to design the right key, and then to, so that it goes to the correct lock and binds to that one, and that is the supermolecular part. So you have had experiences with an array of major and fields of study. So you pursued philosophy and natural sciences, and at points even studied. Do you continue to pursue your interest in other fields, and how do you manage to juggle so many hats at the same time? Excuse me, it was a problem. I think it was uh, there was a noise and I didn't understand. Could you make it shorter? <laughs> the most important part of this question. <laughs> okay, so so like you have so many interests. So like, how do you manage to find time for this? Uh, it takes all my time. <laughs> but of course, it's not enough. <laughs> there are only 24 hours in a day only seven days in a week and only 52 weeks in a year. So it takes all the time. And uh, when would all of us, you too, I'm sure, would like to have much more time, many more hours, but that's just it is. Uh, I manage, I manage, it means take a lot of time and you have to work very hard, that is for sure. Yes, sir. So, so uh, what advice would you like to give for young researchers like us who want to be, who want to achieve high honors in their work and become distinguished and renowned scientists like yourself? I, you know, it's very difficult. I know everybody. I am very happy usually to hear that young people like you and like others who are listening are eager to. Uh, uh, to, to accumulate knowledge, to study science, to make things better, and to also have a better, uh, let's say, a view of the world and of the society, which will improve it. Um, what advice can I give? First of all, it's a lot of work. That is for sure. Work hard. It is not always much fun. It's not always very funny. 
And in many cases, what you want to do doesn't work out. My chemistry is, we have been doing some theoretical chemistry many years ago. Now it's on entirely experimental. There are many experimental experiments which don't really work out. But let me give you just very simple advice, which can help. Uh, it is not very detailed, not very precise advice, but in general terms. My first advice is, if you do research, of course, it's the same for technology also, but especially for basic research. First advice, don't, do not miss the train. What I mean by that is that when you do something, there is an effect. Be careful to analyze and to note, to notice everything that result wants to tell you. There are many instances in your life where there is some result, you, have an, you do something, there is some result. You were expecting something, I'm well, happy if you get it. But often the result of your action wants to tell you, if I may say, more than what you were looking for. And that is often the most important. Don't miss the occasion to find something new. And in order to do so, you have to be very attentive. You have to look carefully at what happens. Second advice, do not jump on a train which has already left. I mean by that, that of course, there are important things in science, but there are also bandwagons. There are areas which develop so much that anybody, everybody wants to jump on it. If you want to do something original, try to do something else. Don't jump on something which is already very populated. Don't jump on a train which is already full. Try to find another train. The best is to, have the, to make the train yourself. That's the best. The third advice is think perpendicular. I mean by that, think in a way which is perpendicular which is at 90 degrees of what you have always learned. Of course, what we learn in school, what we learn in universities, what we learn around us with our teachers, with our colleagues, with our friends, that is very important. But when you do research, especially, you have to ask yourself sometimes, what would happen if I did something which is 90 degrees with what I know, even opposed to it. In most cases, it is usually stupid to do so. But in some cases, this, this mental exercise, this exercise of asking yourself these questions may bring you, may show you something which nobody has thought of. Just reverse what you know and what you seem to know, what you think is right. And then you can get ideas which are totally new. But be careful because in most cases, it is stupid. But in some cases, it's highly original. So that's really inspiring. One more question. How supermolecular chemistry helps in cancer treatment? Cancer treatment. You know, I mean, it comes back to the earlier question. Cancer, yeah, okay. It's a very complicated uh, disease because there is not one cancer. There are many cancers which have very different origins. So again, uh, there are many ways in which it can help. First of all, developing a drug which will act on a specific, um, a specific characteristic of a cancer cell you see, for instance, in the picture I have shown, the killer cells have ways to sense the cancer cell because the cancer cell develops on the surface of, this, this, of the cell specific molecules, which are a signal that I am a cancer cell. These signals, they exist, they are present in the surrounding the membrane 
in the membrane of the cancer cell. And the killer cells, they realize, they find out that these molecules are present and then they destroy the cancer cell. But as I said, there are many, many different ways and cancer cells have become very good at hiding. They often, show, they often try to hide their identity so that the immune system, which is supposed to kill a cell, which is are supposed to kill the cancer cells, do not recognize them, don't find out. They have a sort of a, they try to develop ways to hide from the attacks of the killer cells. And there are now modern technologies which have been developed. There has been a Nobel Prize in that field a few years ago, which is called, uh, which is a, an immunological approach to that. And this is using our immune system to make it able to recognize the cancer cells, even if they hide between in given ways. So this is, you know, it's molecular because these are molecules. It's supramolecular because the way in which they recognize one another, that's supramolecular. And the release, the uh, bringing, yeah, okay. I mean, there are many ways one could talk much about that, but making the drug is one thing and then finding the right way of also delivering it. And there are many processes of delivering the drug, not only delivering, but also delivering to the right spot, to the right place. That is also in large part supramolecular. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful lecture. I'm sure that I'm speaking on behalf of the entire audience watching us right now, that you have positively revealed groundbreaking thoughts and promising ideas while instilling a new perspectives in our lives. Thank you for the impactful and thought-provoking session. We hope you all enjoyed the session. I'm Sushmita Gaude signing off. Until next time, this is Technovanza BJTI. So let me say, let me say to, to congratulate this kind of organization. Oh, when you look at Technovanza on the web, it looks like a lot of gimmicks. There are lots of things which are funny, which is good. To do science, you need also fun. But I think the important thing is also that one has to bring to you, to young people, that science is also an effort. You cannot just get it out flying, coming down from the sky. Let me tell you, when you want to play an instrument, you have very nice instruments, music instruments in India. I like them very much. You have to learn it. You have to learn it. You cannot just, it doesn't come like that. You great musicians, they have learned that. If they don't learn it, they are bad musicians. So the same is true for science. You have to learn it. You have to learn the basics. Then you become a good scientist. Like if you learn how to play your instrument, you become a good musician. So don't be afraid. There's a lot of work but the rewards are very high and we all have to count on all of the young brains. The young brains are important for our future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Question, how many people were connected? Do you know that?